This is still the norm in Bozeman. When you go to get a building permit, you have to submit your landscaping plans. And almost every one is about grass and pine trees. The story here starts in 1957 when my dad bought an 80 acre, this was a wheat farm. And he developed this as one of the first subdivisions in Bozeman. He died young and I inherited what was left of the land. I don't believe in subdivisions anymore. Something I'm promoting is called urban agriculture. This would be a better model than just grass. When the ranch was purchased, it came with um, some of the earliest water rights. The property still has 1869 water rights on it. We're currently using the water rights to irrigate a bunch of condos over here. And when I inherited this land, it was just Kentucky bluegrass. And I thought that was a waste of water. And so I thought a garden would be the proper thing to use water rights for. And nobody complains that it's not sort of golf territory. I mean, sometimes HOAs can be a bit picky. <laughs> it's not all grass or it's not. Everybody loves this and everybody goes by and they say they really like what we've done here. The two people <clears throat> that had houses down here that didn't like it have both moved away. <laughs> so now we don't have anybody that's upset with what we're doing. And it looks pretty. It's just, yeah, not typical HOA material. So this was the original garden here. When I inherited this land in the early 2000s, it was just a big Kentucky bluegrass field that I was mowing and watering. That seemed like a real waste of precious water. And so we tried a number of different things on growing food. This is this greenhouse here that we're going into, the sunken greenhouse. It's dug three feet down and then the soil was backfilled three feet up, so it's actually six feet underground. And of course, what it does is it keeps it warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer because you're buried down into the ground. So you're getting the natural temperature of the in-ground. Because in Bozeman, it gets wet in the winter time. Yeah, last winter, I think it got to maybe about 35 below zero, which puts us at zone three, zone four. So that really limits us on what we can grow. This greenhouse, right, without any heat input, raises the temperature 20 degrees. So we have zone six inside. And we're just experimenting with a whole bunch of different things. This is a honeyberry bush here, which produces something like a blueberry. But since blueberries won't grow in our alkaline soil, we have to uh, pick something else. And then this is a pear tree, Asian pear tree. And a lot of these are zone four to zone six. And because we keep the wind off and it's 20 degrees warmer than outside, we can grow stuff that we can't grow outside. This is an apricot tree. And this is a nectarine tree here. This is another Asian pear. These are American ground nuts. We were looking at something that would go up our trellises so we did some research on what could survive in here, and that was one of the things that we started last year. The one in back here is kiwi, which would not grow outdoors, and we've got two of them. We have not successfully gotten any fruit off of them yet. So you're experimenting a bit. This is completely experimental. That's correct. These are nectarines here. I'd like to visit this place in winter when it's very, because it's not gonna be as cold as outside then. Right. It's always about 20 degrees warmer. In the winter time, do you need additional? We do not heat this. So it still gets cold. So if it's 35 below zero, then it's what, minus 15 in here? But between raising the temperature 20 degrees and keeping the wind off of it, we can grow a lot of things that we wouldn't normally be able to grow here. So you can see we've got some fig trees here. Here's one here, here's a, this was our original one. It's probably one of our more successful trees. 
how far underground are we? So we're six feet underground. We dug down three and then buried the walls up the side three feet. So it's a total of six feet underground. Going underground stabilizes the temperature so it keeps it warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. By doing that, I can move our zone four up to zone six with no fossil fuel input. So without heating, we can just grow more things. So the roof? What is the roof material? It's called Solex, mm -hmm. and it's a corrugated plastic. And it seemed like it cost to do this much, you know, three or $4,000. The greenhouse itself cost about $100,000. And one of the reasons it was so expensive is because we had to meet Bozeman building codes. They made us dig down a lot deeper than we wanted to go. We had to put road mat down because we're really close to the water table. And we had to build it to residential living standards, which seems a little ridiculous. So yeah, it was kind of expensive. I think you could do it for twenty to $30,000 for a 1,500 square foot greenhouse. Also, you wouldn't have to have stucco beds. These are all cinder block and stucco. So we made it look real pretty because this greenhouse is a showcase to show what could be done in the Gallatin Valley for producing food. Okay. So, and it could be something that you don't need or necessarily need additional land. You can just build it alongside a home, right? I mean, this is sort of an example. Definitely, these could be hooked onto the homes. When I inherited this land, I inherited this RV garage. My dad was an RVer and uh, he had a mini Winnie. And so this building here housed his mini Winnie. I don't do that, so after he died, we converted this into our garden kitchen. So this used to be a garage door, so I took that out, put windows on it. This used to be a really high ceiling, so we put this floor in and then the upstairs is a place where children can play. Adults can't quite stand up in it. So originally this was just one big room all the way back and I put the ceiling in and I... And then we do have a bedroom here. So at one point I was going to live here. We put this wall across and we have a composting toilet back here. And then you can see the garden there. Right. So actually, you do have the greenhouse attached to a home. In a sense, but no one lives here permanently. Yeah. You want to go in? That's the house. The yeah. problem with this as a living space is it doesn't have passive solar to warm it up. So even though we've got a greenhouse out there, none of that heat or light comes into here. So it actually is kind of cold in here. Yeah. Just be careful climbing because it's like yeah. a, a ship's galley instead of an actual suburban <laughs> dwelling. Yeah. You can this is up. so cool! We've had sleepovers here where the children can sleep upstairs. So I built an earth ship in Texas, which I still have, and I live in that in the winters. What's the altitude of Bozeman? Bozeman is 4,800 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. Almost a mile, but not quite. And this is more permaculture here, where we're integrating different kinds of plants together to work together synergistically. So, so what are these chimneys? Oh, those are the cooling tubes for the greenhouse. So that uh, when the vents open, it actually pulls the air through those little chimneys down underground and then it goes in. And so that cools it in the summer. And you can see the vents over here. So those are cooling tubes. You can see that it's open right there. So the hot air is escaping out there. And as the hot air escapes, it's pulling the cooler air down those chimneys. And then they go down underground and then they come out. You can see the vents on the floor down there. It's pulling cool, cool air in. The air heats up and hits the ceiling and then just slides along the ceiling and goes out there. And so right now here it's 105. It's pretty hot up here. It's hot, yeah. But when you go downstairs, it gets really cool. 
So as it cools down in the evening, then they'll slowly close and then they'll go fully closed. In the winter, of course, we just leave them closed all the time. So we collect the water off the roof, and this is a 5,000 gallon cistern right here. So the water is stored in here. So there's 5,000 gallons in there. So oh, that's it right there. Right. Right there. Oh and we use that water to water the, the plants. And there's a pump here, okay. and then it pumps the water out. These filters here filter the water going inside, and that sink inside is using rainwater. So this is pretty self-sufficient. Yeah, I was trying to build a self-sufficient house here that has solar panels on it and the watering system so that we could live here off-grid. And it's pretty close to that. You can see our faucets here. So when I turn that on, that's rainwater. And you can hear the pump came on. So it's pumping out of the cistern. Quite self-sufficient. Right. For a conventional looking subdivision. <laughs> Super local, huh? <laughs> yeah. What's the lowest these trees can be? These trees were probably not like colder than 10 degrees, maybe. It's just kind of a nice, that there's this kind of generational thing with your father doing one thing and you doing another. Right, I went in a different yeah. direction for yeah. sure. He and I were both electrical engineers and we were building computer controlled control systems. And this greenhouse is actually controlled by one of those control systems. Yeah, can you see the little white thing up there? Yeah. That's got a temperature probe and a humidity probe in it. And there's several of them around the greenhouse and the computer reads those every second. And then it can open the vents and there is a big fan it can turn on too if it needs to. I can look at the temperature and control this greenhouse and the watering system of my pumps anywhere in the world and humidity in here, it's on the internet. Okay. But the interesting thing is I've been getting away from high tech to grow in kind of a low tech manner. This is a gumi berry and I'd never heard of it no. until two years ago, and they're just thriving in here. And who do you, how are you learning from? Or? Well, we're doing something called permaculture, which stands for permanent agriculture, or actually now just permanent culture. Interestingly enough, we tried another berry, blackberry, which, you know, in Oregon is just, in Washington, just completely invasive. <clears throat> there is some blackberry and over here some blackberry and it does not thrive here so we're going to rip it all out i think it probably doesn't get enough sun you like goji berries so the permaculture it's all about observing nature and trying to mimic nature and trying to use your energy inputs and your resources to grow without a lot of electricity that you have to buy they taste better dry, I think. That's the only way we've had them. They taste a little bit weird, don't they, when they're fresh? Yeah. This is a mulberry tree. And I mean, a lot of people will laugh. They can grow mulberries outdoors, but we actually have to grow it indoors. You can't find mulberries in the store because they don't, they don't keep. You can't ship them. Really? All you can do is just pretty much eat them off the tree. Come here, she's going to show you the mulberries. She might let you try some. Well, I'll let you try some for sure. We have, uh, you know, these in the bowl that your sister helped collect. So try that. They're very sweet. The red mm. ones are not so sweet. They're very good. As you might imagine. <laughs> and so the idea is this could produce for how many people? Something this big? I think I did a calculation once that if we had a thousand, two thousand square foot greenhouses, we could produce a substantial amount of our fruit without having to truck it in. But you'd need a thousand of them for a hundred thousand people. So we'd need a completely different economic model than we currently have. When New York City hit a million people in mid 1800s, all their food was grown within seven miles 
So the Gallatin Valley now is up to about 100,000 people. We have a much more severe climate than New York, but I would say we could grow a lot of our food for 100,000 people in the valley if we had these. Because Bozeman is cold, zone four, we need something really hot to grow peppers. So this is our pepper house. And so you can see we're growing all kinds of different peppers. These are uh, fruit trees here. That's an apple tree. That's a cherry tree. And this is a sea buckthorn. We're into permaculture now. So we're trying to have a whole guild of different types of plants. This is sort of a typical annual garden, but in the back here is something called permaculture. An example of permaculture is that you have different plants helping each other in a synergistic way. And often they use a fruit tree as a centerpiece. You can see we're growing parsley and various other plants underneath, like rhubarb. As part of the guild here, this tree is being supported with strawberries underneath. We have a lot of comfrey. That's what this plant is here, which has a big tap root, which tends to bring minerals up from deep in the ground. And we've got mint. We've got elderberry. And it's called planting a guild of plants that support each other. Some will be nitrogen fixers. <clears throat> Some will be pollinator plants. And that's part of the experimenting, is to see what combinations work. So this permaculture, end of it here, I think we started in 2012. So it's fairly old and it's evolved and you can see we had a nice fruit tree here and it died. So just like in nature, things grow, things die and it keeps changing. Every year it looks different in here. However, the annual garden we try to plant the the same things. We have many pollinators here. One of the women in the garden group does our bees for us. The purpose of the electric fence is to stop bears, and we have had bears come in here. So these are currants here. And then these are gooseberries. So we can get one kind of food, and then <clears throat> in other places we have raspberries and strawberries. But then you go in the sunken greenhouse, right, and we can get things like gummy berries, which won't grow outdoors here. You can see all the currants coming here. Those look like they're ready to eat. <laughs> nope, they're really sour. Do you imagine a time when all these homes have a garden attached? It could be extended, I think, to urban agriculture where you have a group of farmers that just farm people's yards. You know, doing this kind of thing is too much work for just a homeowner, but if they could partner with a group of farmers that are doing urban agriculture, and then they come in and then they farm the person's yard, and then the person that has the yard wouldn't have to pay for lawn mowing services and things like that, and then they could get a portion of the food and then the, the group doing the urban agriculture could then sell the rest of their products to, you know, the local co-ops and things like that. What this plot of ground here has been so successful at is creating a new community of people. And uh, we've created what I call a bonded tribe. This is a hoop house here. So we're running this as a communal garden, and it's currently just open to anybody who wants to come and garden with us. And this is Rose here. She's Hi. one of the garden members. <laughs> and we assign out work days, and it's Rose's work day, correct? My day. So you share, everybody has to work if you're part of it. Right. The way it works is Sundays from 1 to 6 is a general work day for everybody. And uh, then we have a potluck at six, which has bonded us into a nice bonded tribe of people that are working together to grow food. A bonded tribe being a group of people doing something to make, make a living together. In this case, we're growing food together. And doing that bonds people in a way that, say, getting together and watching football on the couch does not bond people very well. 
So this is different than a community garden where you assign different plots to people and within their plot they will grow all the vegetables they want. Instead, this is done communally. We decide what we want to grow. And then as a communal group, we weed it, plant it, <clears throat> water it, harvest it. One of the really nice things has been if people want to go on vacation, then other people just fill in. And then you share the crop. And we share the crop. We share the crop based on how much work people donate. Bye, Rose. If they only want to donate an hour a week or less, that's fine. They just wouldn't get as much food. But the garden has actually been so abundant that we actually wind up throwing away a lot of the food. These are grapes and they were in the greenhouse and they were just thriving. They just covered all of the trellises in the greenhouse for two years. And then on the third year, they got white flies. So we moved them all outside here. So that was an experiment where if you're going to have grapes in a greenhouse, you would need to spray pesticides, which we don't want to do. I can show you how we make our own fertilizer. Okay. Doing something called compost tea. So the comfrey plant that I told you about, we cut it up. And this is a plant that has a deep tap root and brings a lot of minerals up and we put it in water and we have an aerator. We also pour some of this fertilizer in and we let this go for one to two weeks and then it makes this really black oily <laughs> goo which then we mix with water and we use that for our fertilizer. And then we also make our own compost. And then up until last year we'd actually been going around to the coffee shops and throwing in the coffee and and tea but it got to be an awful lot of work and <clears throat> so now our compost is just made from on-site material and so a combination of compost and this compost tea is how we get our fertility so nothing goes to waste right that's right everything is in a cycle everything is recycled here on our garden Replacing grass, I guess you could do more of the, some of the permaculture stuff. Would that be less intensive? It still takes some work, still, but yeah. I believe that it does take less work. And the lawn needs to be mowed at least once a week and trimmed once a week or it starts to look shabby. But you can let a permaculture go for a month and it just gets taller and taller and still looks pretty good. And then when you go in, you do something called lop and drop. Oftentimes you just cut stuff and let it fall in place and then it will rot and that adds to the fertility. I think permaculture overall is a little bit less labor intensive, but it produces, in my opinion, something that looks more interesting and it's producing food where a lawn produces no food. Bye, Larry. You can see how the garden members just come and go.